surgery live from Duke Spine Institute, Surgery Center Vieira. And it is now December 1st, 2022. It's coming to the end of the 2022 year. This is our second surgery for the day. The first patient did not want to broadcast. And so we, we did the surgery. He's doing fantastic. Um, this is our second patient for the day. And this patient comes to us with how many years of back pain? 20 years of back pain. And his story is something I have to share. I'm not going to tell you his name. We're not going to share that kind of information. However, I am going to tell you that his story, story saddens me to no end. And it's the main reason why we do these broadcasts, to teach people the truth. He has had back pain. He was desperate. He went to a doctor who did a microdiscectomy on him. He got no better. And it turns out the doctor wasn't even a real surgeon. And a microdiscectomy, for those of you who don't know, is actually a surgery, spine surgery. It's supposed to be done by spine surgeons. There's two types of spine surgeons. There's orthopedic spine surgeons and there's neurosurgeons. And that's it, folks. There's no other type of spine surgeon. Lay still. Shot? Well, the anesthesiologist was so greedy for money he didn't care about the fact, AP, AP. He didn't care about the fact he wasn't trained to do spine surgery. And he sold this patient on a surgery that he should never be doing as an anesthesiologist, ever. All right, so we're too medial. But also that he is not qualified to do, and there's no way he would know how to do that procedure the right way. Okay, so this patient underwent that treatment, shot, shot, and didn't get any better, okay? So if that wasn't bad enough, he then went to another doctor, and that second doctor was a, not a very good surgeon. How's our blood pressure? Good. Yeah, it's good. Let's go AP again. And that doctor put in a piece of metal. Do you guys see the piece of metal there on the uh, x-ray at L45 sitting inside his disc? Yes, we see it. So we get a lot of questions about some device called the barricade device. Well, that is the barricade device. You can see it. And it is absolutely garbage. It's put in for one reason. It's put in because pain management doctors who are not qualified to do surgery, they put it in so they can make money. They get paid a lot to put it in and it doesn't work. That's why real surgeons don't do it, okay? I would never put a barricade device in, ever, because it doesn't work. It's a piece of garbage. And I have far better surgeries that I can do, all right? So real surgeons, good surgeons, do real surgeries that actually help patients get better. We don't put barricade devices in. AP? But you can see it. Show, show them the device, Monica, just real quick. Run over there and show them so they can see the device. And it's actually, and the patient knows this because I went over this with him. It's eating into the bone right there. Show them the part it's eating in. It's eating in down there and it's eating in above. It's wobbling. It's, it's not moving itself, but the bones are moving relative to the surface. So barricade device, complete garbage. The patient didn't get any better. So then he went to a third surgeon who did laminectomies over at the Bonatti Institute. And again, didn't do better at all. He's just still in horrible pain. Now he's here, and we're going to try to help him, okay? But you can actually see that the other surgeons removed a lot of bone out of his spine. Take a look at that. Show them all the bone gone. And by the way, they operated at the wrong area, right where my needle is. You see my needle tip? See that big white, like, sausage? Yes. Keeps going? all the way around. That whole thing is there's supposed to be bone there. It's all gone. And that's at L5S1, folks. There was really not much wrong at L5S1. It's pretty normal looking. We are going to go and fix it because he does have a tear there. But their, um, their treatment has been completely a, a blunder. So why am I bringing this up? Because so many people around the country are getting procedures that don't work. All right. Um, let's take a look at the 
I think we're off a little bit on the on the uh, uh, orbit. Let's try to do a degree of orbit. Other, see, take a shot there. Let's see what that does. Nope, other way. So before, as a spine surgeon, before you start doing surgery, you've got to navigate down to the spine. It's very important. AP? That's better, by the way. Let's go to an AP view. It's a little better. We're still off, but let's go to an AP view. You have to make sure your x-ray machine that you're using for navigation has a really good view of what's happening, okay? And that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to get the x-ray picture perfect so that I can do a really good surgery for him. Shot? And if you don't have the x-ray picture perfect, you're going to end up going somewhere you're not supposed to go. Shot? So let me get this right, Shot. And because so much bone has been removed, shot, from L5S1, it's making it challenging, shot, for me to get to where I need to go. Shot? AP? So we're going to be fixing three discs today. The worst one is the middle one, L4-5, and the second worst one is L3-4. The not so worst one is the one I'm working at right now. Shot. Looking good. I'm feeling the facet, and I have to feel the facet. Shot. Because, like I said, AP, you're going to be going back and forth a lot here, okay? So just get used to it and don't lock it down so, so much every time. How's our patient doing? Good. All right, that's looking good. Are you comfy? So I'll be navigating through the foramen right now. Um, all right, the orbit, I think we're okay. Where do you feel that? AP. Where does he feel it? I want to make sure he's not feeling it down his leg. That looks really good. All right, we're okay. We're okay. All right, next stop will be the, uh, the L4-5 disc. I need a, a little bit of num-num. We're going to numb his skim up so that he doesn't feel anything as we make our first incision and hopefully only incision. Usually we can fix a couple of discs with one incision. Let's show our audience why people get back pain from a herniated disc. Lay still, you're doing great. What's the mechanism by which people get back pain? Can you show them uh, the educational video, please? Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots, causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain.
If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Yep. And all right, we're back and we're just about to place the needle on the left side at 045. I want to show you how much bone has been removed by prior surgeons before me. And and Monica's doing a good job of that. Let's look at the the pedic uh, let's look at the facet joint on the right side at L45. Show them the spinous process of L4. There, right there. Now, show them the off of the spinous process to the right. You can see the lamina. Go to the right. There. No, go left. There. That bone up and down, that's lamina right there. Lamina. Now, show them the inferior facet coming off the lamina going down to the right. Come. Nope. Yeah. You're moving around everywhere. Stop doing that. Down to the right. Go, go. That. Right there. Circle that. To the left a bit. That is the inferior facet right side of L4. Now show them on the left side. Straight across. There is no inferior facet. It's gone. They literally drilled it away. Duck, uh, I don't know exactly who did it. I'm not going to mention names. But show them where it was amputated off. Go up a little bit, up, up, stop. See that gray line right there? That is where it was cut off, and it's missing. And even more bone is missing at L5-S1. So folks, why am I talking about this? Most spine surgeons are horrible. They are not going to make you better. You've got to go to a good one, someone who knows what they're doing. Otherwise, they're just going to mess your spine up, and you're going to be in for operation number seven. All right. I feel horrible for these patients that have to endure this kind of abuse. Lay still. All right, I can feel the herniation right now, by the way. Lay still. That's probably what he's feeling. Okay, we went through it, and we're inside the disc. So we are now inside the L45 disc, just like that. And we're going to place one final needle. And this is going to be at the L3-4. OK? And then we'll be done placing the three needles we need to place. Now this, this disc is also damaged, but they didn't get to this one, so they left it alone. Thank God. Don't move. Try to stay still, my friend. Shot. I need you to keep, stay still. Keep your head still. Stay you still. Keep, keep your head still, sir. Shot. All right. Henry, while I'm getting access to this last disc, run the video showing how the Duke laser disc repair works. Yeah. Henry? I, I apologize. Repeat that one more time. Run the video on how the Duke laser disc repair works, please. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. All right, well, we're looking at the x-ray here, the AP view, and you can actually see where the skin incision is, right? Show them the skin incision. That's where all three needles intersect, right there, okay? And then from that point, they diverge in dramatically different trajectories. Come on back and let's get a lateral view. We're about to place our final needle at the L3-4. 
Or is he awake? How are you doing, my son? You okay? All right, we're going to put you to sleep in a few minutes, okay? Can you hear me? Do you know who this is talking to you? Is it Santa Claus? Huh? All right, he's not quite with it yet. Because the correct answer is yes, I am Santa Claus. I am going to give him what he wants for Christmas, which is an, a pain-free back. That's what I expect. This is L34 disc. I'm just drawing it on his back. L45 and the L5S1 disc, the bottom one. The surgeons that came before me that basically took advantage of this poor soul, which is very common, we see it all the time out there around the world, doing laminectomies, microdiscectomies, foramenotomies, a bunch of surgery that's old fashioned like a dead woolly mammoth. It is so bad and old fashioned. All right, sorry, love the woolly mammoth, but they're extinct. And those procedures will be extinct someday when every surgeon learns how to do things properly, which is the endoscopic treatment. Transferamo. Everything okay, guys? Huh? So we're going to test these three discs because he's got tears and damage in all three, and the prior surgeries didn't work for him. Now, I believe we can fix his back pain because I believe the other surgeons didn't do their job right. They didn't do the right surgery for him. Are you comfy? How are you doing? Are you comfy, yeah. sir? How long have you had back pain for? We said 20 years? 20 years. You don't look even 20 years old. You're so young. All right, 20 plus years of back pain. All right, we're not going to have a conversation. I'm just asking you some questions, all right? Now you can see the incision we're using is a seven or eight millimeter incision. Are you comfortable? Yeah. All right, so we're gonna test L5S1 first. How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? Uh, 10. Wow, so he has a lot of pain. Is that where you typically get back pain? So the L5S1 looks the best on MRI of all the discs, and but he still had 10 out of 10 pain because it's basically, they ruin the stability there and the disc is under a lot of pressure. We're going to relieve that pressure. Is it better now? Yeah. yeah, he said yes, it went away. Now this is the disc where he had the barricade device. You comfortable? Are you comfortable? Are you comfortable? Oh, yeah. I'm talking to you, my friend, not my team. How bad is that? How bad is that? Scale of one to 10. Is that where you typically get your back pain? Huh? All right. Is it better now? So L45, where he had the worst disc herniation and annular tear, where they put the barricade device that was completely useless, 10 out of 10 pain. You better? Now, the patient never knows when I'm going to inject the dye to test the disc because he can't see what I'm doing. He's fully covered. Oh, painful. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Yeah. All right. So all three of your discs were 10 out of 10. I can feel them tighten up, by the way. You can't see that with the video necessarily, but I felt it. Yeah. All right, we're going to put you to sleep. When you wake up, all that back pain that you've had for 20 years will be gone. Okay. All right? Whatever. You pick. I want you to count from 1 to 100 out loud for me. Count out loud from 1 to 100. If you get to 100, I don't pay the anesthesiologist. Oh, he's asleep already, huh? Nice. All right. Keep going. You're counting by tens. 50, 60, 70. I love it. You got to count by ones, though. We got to play within the rules. All right. So our patient is going to sleep. And you guys can see the incision here. We're going to literally fix three discs that he's lived with back pain 20 years. 
from the tears in the back of these discs. Tell me what day it is, right Keep go you need to go to sleep for us. Yeah. And, and I want you to have dreams and visions of sugar plums, okay, since it's Christmas time. Did you ever dream of sugar plums when you were a kid? Did anybody dream of sugar plums? I did. That's what the song told me to do. That's what I did. That was part of the, wasn't it part of the Grinch? Yeah. Night before Christmas. You're right. That's it. Okay. So folks, we are getting ready to start fixing the first disc, which is the number four, five. Luis chose number four, five. That's the one with the barricade device. And our patient is sleeping, right, doctor? Yeah. Is everything okay? Yeah. Now, I do feel scar tissue, by the way. Sean? I can feel quite a bit of scar tissue from his prior surgery. And we're not even at the spine yet. This is all behind the spine from all the surgeries he's had done. Crystal, everything good? Yeah. All right, I can feel the scar tissue, literally. It's like a bowstring, you know? As you're going through, you feel little bands of scar tissue with that dilator. All right, I am at the back of the disc at L45, shot, and I'm literally pushing against the herniation. I can feel it. So I'm gonna push this herniation back inside the disc. That's the first order of business. Now, some people say, Dr. Duke, aren't you doing more damage when you do this? The answer is no. We're actually going through a damaged part of the spine. So this, this part that I'm going through in the back of the disc is the annular tear, and it was damaged by trauma years ago, and that's why he's had back pain for 20 years. Sean? I literally just pushed the herniation back into the disc right there, through the tear. It's one of the beauties of this procedure is we don't make more damage to the spine while we're doing the surgery. We don't do any damage whatsoever. Shot? Want to make sure the dilator doesn't back out on its own. Shot? All right, we are inside the L45 disc, just next to the barricade device. Let's get an AP so we can show the audience. We've lost two drops of blood. That's how bloodless this Duke laser disc repair surgery is. Virtually no bleeding. The entire surgery is going to be done through a eight millimeter incision on the back, a single incision. All right, there's our tube. Show the audience the tube inside the disc. Show them the barricade device. There's our tube. We're gonna do the whole surgery through. There's the barricade. The barricade device is bigger than the damn tube. All right, take your fluoro out. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, we have a question from S. Alred on YouTube. And they ask, what doesn't the Duke laser disc repair, oh, I'm sorry. What doesn't the Duke laser disc repair fix? Oh, what doesn't the Duke laser disc repair fix? Well, that is a wonderful question because it really does fix almost everything related to the spine. Uh, it will not fix my hunger, but my Wendy's chicken sandwich will. No cheese, uh, no cheese right. Pretzel bun. Pretzel bun. Um, and all, all jokes aside, the most common problems with the spine is what we call degenerative problems. And degenerative problems include herniated disc, bulging disc, ruptured disc, um, stenosis, radiculopathy, back pain from the disc. And the Duke laser disc repair fixes 99% of degenerative spine problems. The other problems that happen with the spine include tumor, infection, and fractures. The Duke laser disc repair does not fix tumor, infection, or fractures. Now, tumors, infections, and fractures are only 1% to 
to 2% of spine problems, maybe 1%, okay? So you really, 99% of spine problems are degenerative problems, which the Duke laser disc repair fixes about 99% of those problems, okay? The best thing to do if somebody is wondering is to send us your MRI images and report and do our free MRI review. And then we'll tell you whether or not the Duke laser disc repair is appropriate for you. Um, the most important thing in spine is to make the right diagnosis as to the source of a patient's symptoms. The majority of the time, the source is the herniated disc. Sometimes the source is the facet joint or sacroiliac joint or piriformis muscle. But if the doctor you're working with cannot make the right diagnosis, they cannot prescribe you the right treatment. And the reason is simple. The diagnosis drives the treatment. That's an old saying. It's an old medical saying. The diagnosis drives the treatment. In other words, no matter what you're doing in medicine, whether you're a heart doctor, a cardiologist, or you're a brain surgeon, whatever the diagnosis is, that determines the treatment for the patient. So the whole concept of the diagnosis drives the treatment is not something unique to the spine, but it's part of all of medicine. And um, if you're not treating the right condition, you're not fixing it. So the problem with the spine is that most doctors don't know the diagnosis. About 99% of the doctors treating the spine do not know the right diagnosis for the patient. Maybe 99.9%. That's how big the problem is. It's an educational problem. And it's systemic. It's not unique to the United States. It's worldwide. And that's why patients are suffering with back pain, neck pain today, all around the world. And they're having treatments that don't work because the wrong diagnosis has been made. So the key to successfully treating any condition in medicine is making the right diagnosis. The second most important part to helping a patient with a diagnosis is the right treatment. And once you've made the right diagnosis, there's a variety of treatment options. For example, this patient had the barricade device put in his disc. So I think the doctor that did that made the right diagnosis that the disc was the problem, it was the pain, but he did the wrong treatment. The barricade is a horrible treatment. Its purpose is solely to enrich people and make them money at the expense of the patients. It doesn't work. I would never put it in. I would never put it into a patient. Even my worst enemy, I wouldn't put it in because it's so unethical. Okay, but why do devices like the barricade device exist? Greed. Greed is the answer. Greed is the only answer. Greed. Greed drives treatments in the spine. The doctor who put it in was totally unqualified and shouldn't be treating patients, in my opinion. That aside, the barricade device is useless and horrible. And it's not the only one, by the way. There are many devices that are horrible that should never be put in, including morphine pumps, in my opinion. But that's just one other example. There's hundreds of devices that should not be used. The right treatment is essentially the treatment that targets the source of the patient's symptoms that's the least invasive, that's the safest to do, that has the lowest chance of complications and side effects for the patient, that is going to give them the longest amount of relief. So let's review. Most effective, least chance of complication, and the complications that do happen are very mild and has durability. In other words, it lasts. So effective, low risk, and durable. That's really the qualifications that define treatments. And the best treatment is the one that has the highest score in those categories. 
the Duke laser disc repair is the best treatment by far. There's nothing that even comes close, okay? I, I know because I do all the treatments. I know how to do all of them, and I've done them in my career. And the most effective, safest, fastest recovery is the Duke laser disc repair. For any kind of a spinal stenosis, disc herniation, bulging disc, degenerated disc, this is the best treatment. I hope that answers your question. Do you have any other questions? Yes, we have a comment and another question. This comment comes from Henry Schmid on YouTube. Love the first right. name. I just couldn't hear you. Your vo volume is a little bit too low. Oh, apologies. How's that? Is that okay? Uh, that's better. Thank better? You. No worries. This comes from Henry Schmid on YouTube. I'm loving the first name. Another Henry. Another Henry. <laughs> and they said, I've been watching countless videos and now a huge fan of your work. I haven't had your surgery, but uh, your videos are awesome to watch. Henry, thank you so much, and I really appreciate the sentiment. It means a lot. Um, I enjoy teaching, and I'm hoping someday that, that people suffering with back pain will avoid, avoid treatments that are damaging to their bodies and only harm them. And the only way that's gonna happen, my friend, is through awareness. And awareness comes through knowledge, and knowledge comes through education. And that's what we're trying to do at Duke Spine. We wanna educate people. So that's why we broadcast, and I appreciate your, your appreciation of our work, so thank you. All right, we are almost done at L45. Doctor, the IV pole is kind of blocking my view, if you don't mind lowering it or moving it, either one. Yeah, that's fine. This is all the annular tear, by the way. See the blue stuff here I'm zapping with the laser? That is the nucleus propulsus that is herniated. That is the herniation. I get this question a lot from my audience. But Dr. Duke, if you're removing the nucleus propulsus, there won't be any disc left. I'm not removing the nucleus propulsus that's inside the disc. I'm moving the nucleus propulsus that's herniated. So it's already outside of where it's supposed to be. We're not taking any more nucleus out. Does that make sense? We don't take any normal disc material away. We're only removing the bad stuff that's already out of place. So it's not in the disc anymore, it's in the wall of the disc. Escaping, trying to escape. Okay, um, Henry, let's run the video um, that shows the comparison because the alternative surgery for this patient would be a fusion. And it would be, have to be a three level fusion. Three, four, four, five, five, one. Let's show the audience a comparison of the Duke laser disc repair, which we're doing right now, versus fusion, which would be the alternative procedure. Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A patient with chronic back or neck pain originating from a symptomatic disc injury could undergo either traditional spinal fusion or less invasive Duke Laser Disc Repair. This MRI represents a typical case with L45 and L5S1 symptomatic discs. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, 
fat tissue and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. To accommodate the fusion hardware, a large bone grabber is used to perform a laminectomy by removing bone from the spine. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large pedicle screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. The fusion screws are inserted into the bone, as shown in the x-ray. After all screws are in place, rods are used to connect the screws together to prevent movement of the secured vertebrae. Crosslinks are added to bridge the rods together for additional stability. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home, enjoying life, with a very fast recovery, allowing normal activities without pain. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. Prior to closing the wound, a temporary drain is installed to allow excess fluid to drain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke laser disc repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke laser disc repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke laser disc repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. 
whereas the recovery from Duke laser disc repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement, whereas there is no fusion with the Duke laser disc repair. Normal movements of the joint in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke laser disc repair. In fact, most Duke laser disc repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke laser disc repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke laser disc repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. All right, welcome back. We are finished with the L45, which was the worst one. It had the barricade device. Um, I could feel it with my grabbers inside the disc. I could not see it because it's literally covered in scar tissue. I wasn't able to get through all the scar tissue, but that's okay. Our goal is not to see the device. Our goal was to get rid of his pain. And that's what I feel we're gonna be able to get rid of about 90% plus. Um, we're now moving on to the L34. Remember the L34 was a 10 out of 10. You ready, Luis? So, here we go. Shot? Let's get these cables out of the way. I'm going to remove the spinal needle over the guide wire. And now, folks, I'm going to place this, we call it a dilator, right here, the metal thing. It looks like a pencil. It's going to go right over the guide wire, and the guide wire will guide the tip right to where we want to be. Shot? Uh-huh. Here we go. Shot. Now the dilator does exactly that. Dilation means to spread. It's not a cutter. It's not a scalpel. It's a spreader. And by spreading tissues, it avoids traumatizing those tissues. So there's virtually no trauma. You can see the herniation. You guys see the herniation in the back of the disc? Show them. You see that gray lens behind the disc? That is the herniation. Yep. All right. So we're about to go through the herniation right now. How is he, doctor? We okay? Shot? Perfect. Wonderful. Patient's doing well. He's asleep. We're going to get into the L34 next. Shot. Now notice I still have the guide wire in, and it's guiding me. So I know I'm safe. Wait, wait. Take this. Yep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, I just felt the herniation push. Yeah, go ahead. Shot? Uh-huh. Shot? Perfect. All right, we are in the disc. Yep. Come on out with the fluoro. So now we're inside the L34 disc. That's our next disc to repair. Then the last one will be the L5S1. The L5S1 is going to need the least amount of repairing because it's the normalest looking disc on MRI, but it was a 10 out of 10 pain because it's under pressure. So the main thing with that disc is going to be to relieve the pressure from inflammation, from the tear. The tear is very small. That's why we didn't see it on the discogram, but it's there. There was an old terminology for this kind of painful disc at L5S1. It's called internal disc disruption or IDD. It was the first described years ago by doctors who treated back pain and when they, um, when the person with the back pain died, they would open up their bodies and look in their spines and look at the disc and they actually found internal disc disruption. 
Now I'm seeing a little bit of that right now because if you look here, the ivy pole is in the way again. If you look here, you actually see swollen nucleus propulsus, swollen. See how it looks different than other nucleus? It's kind of billowy and soft like a cloud. That is edematous nucleus propulsus. It's an indication we're dealing with pressure, swelling pressure, inflammation. The nice thing about edematous nucleus propulsus is that the laser zaps it away pretty quick. Unlike scar tissue, which takes much longer. So there's less scar tissue right here. This is a newer injury. There's some scar tissue right there. Any questions from our audience? Henry? I apologize. Arias and I were talking. What, would, what was the question? Oh, uh, does our audience have any questions? Yes, yes, yes. We have a bunch of questions. Apologies on that. We come. We have two questions, three questions that come from S. L. Red on YouTube, and then S. L. Red's uh, first question is: Have you considered teaching this technique at one of the major universities? Yes, S. L. Red. Thank you for asking. Have I considered teaching this technique at one of the major universities? So S. L. Red. Um, I'm just going to digress a little bit on your comment. The answer is yes, I have. The problem is I don't know which one that I would want to teach it at. Of course, any of the major universities would want this technology. Harvard, Princeton, anywhere. Um, but I don't want to live anywhere. That's the problem. I like where I live. I like Orlando. So for me to teach, I'd have to move to a university and teach. So it's interesting that you say that because I am a professor of the uh, neurosurgery at the University of Central Florida, UCF. Not a prestigious school by any means, but a new medical school, progressive in their ideas and teachings. And I'm now in discussions with the dean of the medical school to basically teach at the medical school for the neurosurgery and perhaps orthopedic surgery residents. So Thank you. to answer your question, I thought of teaching. Yes, I'm interested. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for many years, but um, I wanted to make sure I perfected the technique clinically, medically, that the medicine was very good before I go and teach at a university. That said, um, I've also taught the technique at the national meetings for neurosurgeons, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, the Joint Spine Society, the International Society for the Advancement of Spinal Surgery, uh, the Southern Neurosurgery Society, the Florida Neurosurgery Society, the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgical Techniques, and um, the um, AO Spine Meeting in Hong Kong. I've been all over the world teaching. The problem is surgeons don't want to do this surgery because it doesn't pay them as much money as a fusion or artificial disc surgery does. And it's not as mainstream, it's not as, as sexy or interesting to them as putting a metal in. You have to understand there's a, a huge um, commercial interest. I call it the spinal industrial complex where the companies that manufacture the metal implants control the education and training of our surgeons in this country and around the world. And basically these companies don't want us uh, not doing metal. I don't know why, but I have a, a focus issue. I don't know if it's unique to this, this uh, camera, but I'm maxed out on my, on my focus. You understand what I'm saying? Is it something to do with the head? 
the of the uh, of the scope. No, no, I don't think it's a scope. I think it's a camera. So the camera is not able. Is is just the focus is off or something? Yeah. So maybe time for a new camera. Yeah. Let's let's invest in some more cameras, okay? Same ca same manufacturer. Yeah. So I'm sorry about uh, the the answer to your question. I am interested. I will be teaching somewhere someday. I just haven't decided yet where. That's going to largely depend on my son, who I'm uh, hoping someday takes an interest in this. And you know we have to talk about it and decide what the best course of action is. Because I consider my son and my wife to be my business partners, and we have to decide. But Duke Spine Institute is a small company. We're a privately held company. We have one office currently, and you're right. There's so many people that need this care and need access to it. So ultimately, this technology will be universally available in the future. But how it gets there, I'm not sure yet. I don't have a clear vision. And I have to discuss it with my partners to see what their thoughts are. What other questions do we have? Next question comes from S. Alred on YouTube. And his uh, question is, what can the American people do the inc to increase the awareness of this procedure? Uh, so I heard what can I don't know who he's asking. What can who do? What can the American people do to increase the awareness of this procedure? Well, that's a great question. Um, typically, let me explain how things typically work in, in medicine. When there's a new drug or a new treatment available, it's owned by a company that has one purpose, and that is profits, to make money. and that, by the way, this is very important. I want you guys to stop and let's take a look. We are now in the outer part of the tear and look at this inflammatory tissue. Look how pink it is, how red it is. That's blood supply and inflammation. This is where a lot of the pain is coming from, is the inflammation in the annular tear, especially near the outside. So getting back to the answer, there's no commercial interest in this surgery. That's the problem. There's no um, implant being put in. There's no device being sold. There's no drug being utilized, okay? I'll give you an example. Just in the news this week, there is a new drug to, um, to treat a medical condition. And I wanna say uh, I think it's autism, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember exactly. But the drug is for a single dose is $3.5 million for one dose. Now, how many doses does someone need? I don't know. But the point is, is that there's money to be made on that drug. And so who do you think controls and owns the drug? Big companies, venture capital companies. Duke Spine Institute doesn't have a venture capital company behind it. So we don't have uh, an investor that we have to satisfy through sales and marketing to, to sell our product, okay? We, we don't have a marketing division that is spending millions and millions of dollars marketing our treatments. So the only way the word gets out is through our broadcast that you're watching, through our videos on YouTube, through our website, and I used to give talks, and now we're going to start doing more talks again at the national and international meetings for neurosurgeons and spine surgeons. But those talks are, for the most part, useless because it doesn't result in people coming and training. I've opened in the past. At the end of my talks, I said, who's interested? Come talk to me for training. People don't come. Why? Because this surgery doesn't make money for people. It's not a... Uh, a get rich on this surgery kind of surgery because there's no metal, there's no implants. So there's no commercial interest in this surgery as of yet, okay? And that's the problem is you see all these medical devices and drugs and treatments, they're all heavily marketed on television and radio and internet and Facebook 
because there's investors investing money in the marketing and hoping to get a return on investment. We're not that kind of company. We don't have a product that we're marketing or selling. We're just raising awareness of this surgery as an option. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I think that's why um, one of the reasons why we don't have more people knowing about it. So we're using a grassroots effort, grassroots marketing right now or education for people to learn. And frankly, I don't have the budget to, to market it like other medical devices and products. We don't have the money. Um, and I'm not going out looking for investors. Because once you get investors involved, they want money, you're, they, they make you do things you, uh, that are unethical. And I'm not going to do unethical things. Um, so I have no interest in Duke's spine being controlled by money-hungry people. They don't care about other people's health. All right, here's some more inflammatory tissue. Let's take the barricade device this patient's had. They had that device put in, right? There's no respectable neurosurgeon that I know that would put the barricade device in, period. So when you look at who's putting the barricade device in, that device, the metal device we saw, the kind of things that are happening is the company that sells that piece of garbage, all right, that piece of metal, in my opinion, garbage, that company goes to the surgeons and they look, hey, who's desperate surgeon, who wants money? Let's give them something under the table to put our, to put our metal in, a kickback, they call it. Kickbacks, in my opinion, are unethical, and they're illegal. So I don't agree with it, but somehow they're getting a kickback. Now, what's the kickback? I don't know exactly what it is, but it's some type of incentive, whether it's financial money, or it's uh, stock, or it's uh, steak dinners, or vacation for the family, for the doctor that puts it in. I don't know. I don't really care. In the end, if there's a company, when, and they've come to me, by the way, these companies, many times. Oh, we can make you a, a stock owner. We can make you a um, consultant and we'll pay you. I say, no, thank you. I'm not interested. Why? Because it all leads to the same path. They want you to do unethical things to patients, and they're frequently harmful, and I refuse to do that. I have enough money. I don't need to... Uh, sell myself out, my principles out. But lots of other doctors do, they sell out. And that's what I'm trying to protect everybody from, being aware that these doctors exist and they're gonna recommend treatments that don't work, but they're treatments that they offer that make them rich in one way or another. They enrich them, but they hurt the patients. And that's the main message here. And if people understand that, then they're gonna find the best treatment for themselves. And they're gonna come here for the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Because the truth is, is that I can't, I don't just do one treatment, I do all the treatments. I can do anything. But I choose this treatment because it's the best for the patient. But it just so happens that other people don't know how to do it. So it actually works out to where I do it, other people don't do it, but it is the best treatment for the patient. If that makes sense. All right. We're just about done at L34, and then we're gonna go to the L L5S1, and that should be hopefully a quick one, because there's disc is relatively normal. This is all scar tissue at the outside of the tear, on the periphery of the tear. It needs to be debulked, because it's too much. It's putting pressure on the nerves, the nerve roots. Okay, any other questions? Yes, this next question comes from Sammy Hasuna on YouTube. And they ask, any chance to come to your institute to learn the procedure? Yes, there is a chance, Sammy, to come to the institute to learn. But we have to discuss the details um, and make sure that, you know, A, the person is qualified. And I'm not going to just teach anybody this surgery. They have to be highly qualified. They have to be someone I would trust to operate on me. And um, 
So finding qualified people, I don't mean just qualified skill-wise or training-wise, like I'm a neurosurgeon. They have to share my philosophy in life. And if they don't, I'm not going to train them because I'm not obligated to train anybody. Okay? I had to pay for my training through many years of basically what most would call indentured servitude. And I'm not going to give my knowledge away to everybody unless they uh, have to prove themselves that they're capable and deserving of this knowledge. So don't think that I'm just going to give it away to anybody, okay? So as long as the, the, the person who wants to learn is a surgeon by training, a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, and that they are um, highly ethical and want to, they have the same goals and beliefs that I do, then I will train them. Okay? That's the best answer I can give you. We have another question. Yes. This comes from S. Al Red once more on YouTube. And their question is, is it possible to rehydrate a damaged disc? Is it possible to rehydrate a damaged disc? Correct. No. No, it's not. There are people have been trying for years to rehydrate the damaged disc. Nobody has been successful. They're selling things. They're developing things like, um, I won't use any names, but they're developing um, materials that can be injected into the disc to quote unquote rehydrate. I would never put that in because all the reason why they don't have it is for one simple reason. Everything you put in comes back out. And of course, the reason it comes out is that people use their spines for bending, lifting, running, exercising. And when you do, it puts pressure on the disc and it literally forces whatever you put in there, whether it's say a hydrogel, it'll push it out, okay? And I know that there are gels being developed right now, um, but remember, it comes back to what I told you. It's all about money. It's really not about what's best for the patient. The truth is, you don't need water in your disc. And this is something that most people don't understand. Did you change the irrigation? This is an important point. Everyone thinks you need the, the nucleus material inside the disc to have a normal function. You don't. It's not true. Okay, that's what they're trying to sell you on. But it's not true. You can take all of the jelly out of the disc and the patient will have zero pain and they'll have no functional limitations. Zero. Normal. You can be 100% normal activity, normal, no pain, and have no nuclear material in your disc. And I've seen these people thousands and thousands of times. So there's absolutely no need to put an implant in the disc at this time to restore the nucleus. I am against it. All right. Just about done. You can see the epidural space underneath the uh, tra traversing root. The uh, exiting nerve root will be up there. Um, in that blue area. I apologize for the moving around, but just want to finish cleaning this up and then we're done. Okay? You can see the little veins. Pretty cool. Little epidural veins, some epidural fat. All right, we're done here. Lights on, please. This is a transforaminal endoscopic surgery for those of you who know a little bit about the spine. We're going through a hole that's already there on the side of the spine called the neuroforamen. That's the same hole where the nerves come out. And um, Dr. Parvis Cambin at University of Pittsburgh was the first person to describe this technique. That was back, I think, in the 90s. I don't know exactly when he did, but he um, had a very high complication rate I've heard from his students, his residents that he trained, like Dr. Anthony Young, 
he had a high complication rate because he didn't have the best you know, tube and the best instruments. The idea was good, solid. And that's what we use today as a transferimental approach. However, he didn't have the right tools and he had to build the tools himself. So of course, over the years, his students who learned the technique from him have made adaptations and changes to those tools. And I'm using the most latest adaptation um, that's made by Wolf out of Germany. It's FDA approved. And in my opinion, it's the best system out there. But it's not the only system. There are other systems that are manufactured by other companies for transferaminal surgery. I will say this, that in the United States of America, myself and maybe two or three other spine surgeons are the only ones really doing regular transferaminal endoscopic surgery. But in other countries like Korea and China and India now, that more and more surgeons are using this approach, the transferaminal approach, because they understand the value of the surgery. It's a low cost, uh, very effective, and there's no damage done to the spine to get there. Unfortunately, America is getting further and further behind because, um, you gonna do a shot? because we are controlled by big companies that make money off the metal. And they are not going to left, let go of their death grip on the industry. That's why you can't trust these big spine surgeons at the universities. They're all getting paid to keep patients getting metal procedures. And I'm the only person talking about it in the United States. As a matter of fact, I've told this story before this surgery you're watching, I brought this to them and the person in charge of educating the neurosurgeons, Dr. Aaron Cohen Gadol, is a very good neurosurgeon. He's a Israeli neurosurgeon, a very good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, he and I both went to USC med school together in Los Angeles. Aaron is in charge of uh, the operative atlas for neurosurgery and he wanted my surgery highlighted there. But once I produced the video for him to run, he was told by his superiors that he was not, were not allowed to show my surgery to the other neurosurgeons. Even though it's been peer reviewed and published multiple times. And the reason for this, simply because they don't want neurosurgeons seeing this technique and they don't want neurosurgeons not putting metal in people's spines, okay? So after extending an invitation for me to publish the Duke Laser Disc Repair video showing surgeons how to do it, they were, uh, Aaron was excited and, uh, and getting ready to publish it and then he was told if he publishes it, he'd be fired from the job. He's still in that position today. But he never published my surgery. Take one. Take one. So, if you don't think what I'm telling you is the truth, it is the absolute truth. There's a multi-billion dollar industry that sells screws, rods, cages, plates for the spine that does not want endoscopic spine surgery being prevalent in the United States. And they're doing everything in their power to stop it. And it's working because it's basically me against them. And Dr. Young, Anthony Young knows about this. And it was him against them for many years. Now he's retired. And there's an awful lot of movement there, huh? That is definitely not normal. Unfortunately, this is that level that they did the most damage, the other surgeons.
see what I can do, if anything, here. Hopefully I can do something to help him here. You can see the blue material. You can see how scarred the disc is. Despite its relatively normal appearance on the MRI, most surgeons would not have identified this as a pain source. So that goes back to what I said earlier about making the right diagnosis. Maybe I said it in the other surgery, but that's the key. Diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. Diagnosis drives treatment. All right, what other questions? I'm gonna be done in five minutes, doctor. This is not gonna be a long one. No. Oh, of course, sorry. Thanks. No current questions, but we do have a couple comments. This first one comes from Derek Olson on Facebook. All right. And Derek commented, God bless all that you and your team does. Thank you, Derek. God bless you. I think you're in Ireland, if I'm not mistaken. Am I correct? I'm pretty sure Derek Olson has been watching our streams for many years. And uh, I believe he's in Ireland, but I could be mistaken. All right, and the next comment comes from Sherry on Facebook. Hi, Sherry. And this is coming back from one of SL Red's questions about uh, what can the American people do to increase the awareness. Her comment was, the American people have no say uh, in what is right for the patients. It is driven by the insurance companies and has the deepest pockets. And she uh, went on to say uh, she's going through uh, she's going through it right now with an SI joint fusion. Yeah. Well, Sherry, I agree with you. I appreciate your comment. You are right. The insurance companies are the ultimate power in the United States. And they don't say what's best for the patient. They just say what they'll pay for. And when I recommend surgery and my colleagues recommend surgery to patients with spine problems, and the insurance company denies those surgeries, they don't say, doctor, your treatment is um, not good for the patient. What they say is, we feel your treatment is not medically necessary, that it's experimental, okay? But that's the only way they get out of paying because the laws force insurance companies to pay for any kind of medical care that is medically necessary and it lets them get out of paying for experimental treatments. So what they've done over the last 25 years, these insurance companies, is when they don't wanna pay a medical bill, they just say that that was experimental. Now, the problem is, it's okay to say that, you know, a new cancer treatment that's never been proven is experimental, a new drug. But it's not okay to say that surgery that's been done for the last 30 years like spine surgery is experimental, but that's what they're doing. And they're doing it because there's nobody challenging them. There's only one person that can challenge the insurance company and win, and that is the patients. Without the patients challenging their insurance companies, they will not ever change and deny, 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 deny. Let me tell you something. 30 years ago, there was no stopping surgeons from being able to do what they felt was the best for their patient. The patient and the surgeon made the decision together, patient and surgeon. And they would use, and the anesthesiologist was involved too. Patient and their doctors, let's just say. Doctor-patient relationship. Now the insurance companies decide what they're gonna pay for, and that ultimately decides for most people what treatment they're gonna get. Okay, but I'm gonna give you an example. I just had sinus surgery, best surgery I ever had. I can breathe now. I wasn't able to breathe at night. I was suffocating. Now I can breathe without any problem. I was gonna die without that surgery, literally die. And my insurance company, United Healthcare, denied my surgery, said it wasn't necessary. So what did I do? I paid for it out of my own pocket. Why? Because I know it was necessary. My surgeon and I knew it was necessary, and I wasn't gonna just be another statistic of somebody who dies because their insurance company doesn't wanna pay the bill. Denials 30 years ago, non-existent, maybe a million a year. Now, denials every day are a million a day, maybe two million a day. 
So nobody is stopping the insurance companies from killing Americans. I use this analogy. The tobacco industry in the United States, they sell cigarettes that kill people, that causes lung disease like emphysema, COPD, lung cancer. Those tobacco industries spend $50 million a year in Washington, D.C., lobbying our politicians so that they can have laws that let them sell to cigarettes that kill people. The health insurance industry spends $500 million a year lobbying politicians. So if you can kill people legally with cigarettes for $50 million a year in lobbying, what do you think you get for $500 million a year? You get 10 times more. So the insurance companies are killing people by denying their treatments and not paying for them. Most people can't afford a $100,000 medical bill for surgery at the hospital when they need surgery. So they just do what their insurance tells them and they end up suffering as a result. Well, I refuse to let the insurance companies dictate my health. And I think every American should refuse that. United Healthcare just posted that next year in 2023, they expect to make $360 billion in revenue. Now you tell me, a company that makes the most money in the United States for health insurance, $360 billion a year, they can't pay for somebody's sinus surgery when they're gonna die or their back surgery when they're gonna commit suicide because of the back pain. That's wrong. And the only way to stop them is through the court system. And it has to be done through the American people. I'll take the rest of your questions when I get to the conference room and I'll do a face-to-face. -face. So type up your questions. In the meantime, for those of you who don't know, we do have our own app. It's free, you can download it from the App Store. It's Duke Spine Institute app. You can download it for your iPhone or your Android. Hey, Henry, show the audience how small this incision was. Can you see that? Yes, sir. That's about eight millimeters, okay? The whole surgery was done through that. This patient's gonna go home in an hour, walking out of here. No hospital, no complications, and no painkillers, by the way. We don't give opioids painkillers, only Tylenol for this surgery. What a difference. All right, you can cut off to uh, DLDR versus fusion so they can see the difference. Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A patient with chronic back or neck pain originating from a symptomatic disc injury could undergo either traditional spinal fusion or less invasive Duke Laser Disc Repair. This MRI represents a typical case with L4-5 and L5-S1 symptomatic discs. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. 
The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. To accommodate the fusion hardware, a large bone grabber is used to perform a laminectomy by removing bone from the spine. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, Steristrips, and a Band-Aid. Total time for the Duke Laser Disc Repair Surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large pedicle screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke Laser Disc Repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. The fusion screws are inserted into the bone, as shown in the x-ray. After all screws are in place, rods are used to connect the screws together to prevent movement of the secured vertebrae. Cross-links are added to bridge the rods together for additional stability. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home, enjoying life, with a very fast recovery, allowing normal activities without pain. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. Prior to closing the wound, a temporary drain is installed to allow excess fluid to drain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen, in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke Laser Disc Repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke Laser Disc Repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke Laser Disc Repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke Laser Disc Repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, Patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke Laser Disc Repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke Laser Disc Repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself, whereas the recovery from Duke Laser Disc Repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement, whereas there is no fusion with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Normal movements of the joints in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. In fact, most Duke Laser Disc Repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer-reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute.
With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke Laser Disc Repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. One. And hope you're enjoying our live stream broadcast from Duke Spine Institute here in Orlando, Florida, Melbourne, Florida, specifically on the Space Coast, where we can actually watch rockets launch into space. Um, I think SpaceX just launched a rocket the other day, right? I think so, yeah, yeah, Artemis. And literally, they're 10 minutes from where we are. Um, so this patient has some unique learning points. Um, the most important, he's young, he's had back pain for 20 years. Unfortunately, he went to the wrong doctors who took advantage of him. And to be quite honest with you, he knows that already, and he's very unhappy about it. Uh, we've talked about it in the past. His first surgery was actually done by an anesthesiologist who is not a surgeon, but he did a surgery anyway because the money was too good to say no. And so he had a microdiscectomy, this patient had a microdiscectomy done. And you could see during the surgery, if you go back and look at the x-ray pictures, we did the front back picture and you could see all this bone here was completely removed by an unqualified doctor and what that does, unfortunately, is it weakens your spine because removing the bone from your spine is gonna weaken your spine. That's like removing some walls on your house. What do you think is gonna happen the next time the wind blows? It's gonna blow your house down. You cannot take structural support elements out of your spine and expect it to have a normal stability. Doctors will tell you that. That's what they told me when I was training. My superiors, my teachers said, oh yeah, you know, everyone does it, it's okay, the spine won't be unstable. Nonsense. They're just justifying those treatments. It's bullshit, okay? When you start taking bone and ligaments out of your spine, of course it's going to weaken it because those bones and ligaments hold your spine together when you move, all right? So if you're moving, what's keeping you from moving too far are the bones and ligaments. So when you start removing bones and ligaments, your spine's gonna start going too far. And when it goes too far, it's gonna start straining those structures that are still in place that are supposed to stabilize your spine from um, um, extreme movements, okay? So you just start, you start going down this, this whirl, whirlpool of, of destruction. So I don't recommend microdiscectomy or laminectomy. I did a laminectomy the other day because that patient was 80 years old and she had only leg symptoms, neurogenic claudication, no back pain, she did not want anything else done. I gave her what she wanted, okay? Uh, it was a reasonable surgery to do, but I try to steer everybody away from open back surgery and laminectomy. It's a highly destructive surgery. Anyway, after the unqualified anesthesiologist did his first surgery, he then went to an unqualified neurosurgeon who then did the barricade device, which did absolutely nothing to help the patient. He went through another surgery, had a metal device implanted, Obviously, he made somebody a lot of money, but he himself got stuck suffering in pain, worse pain than he had before the surgery. So in desperation, he went to a third surgeon over in Tampa, uh, specifically in an area, um, if I can remember the, uh, the town. I, I don't mind saying the town, but I won't mention the surgeon's name, but he's been there for a long time. And um, anyway, I don't recall the town. <laughs> That's okay though. But that surgeon did laminectomies as well and the patient did not get any better. His back pain got worse. So finally he came to Duke Spine Institute and said, Doc, is, what's going on? Why am I in pain? Is there anything that can be done to help me? I took a look at his MRI and I said, absolutely. You've got an annular tear here, an annular tear here, and you got another one down at L5S1. That's where your back pain is coming from and I could do my laser surgery and I expect it's gonna work. Then he said to me, you guarantee it? And I said, no, I don't guarantee anything. However, we do have a guarantee program and that guarantee program is available for you to purchase. If you have any problems afterwards, we take care of it on our dime. Well, of course he didn't want the guarantee program because it's very expensive. Most insurances, insurance companies usually have to pay for that. Um, the reason why we don't guarantee is because 
I may do a perfect job, then the patient goes out and the next day he's working in his yard, you know, lifting cement bags out of his truck, building a cement foundation for a chicken house. And I can't be responsible for people doing stupid things to ruin their back, okay? So um, long story short, he ultimately finally decided he's gonna go for it and we just did his surgery. And I know he's gonna watch this tonight because he watches a lot of our videos and I'm gonna tell you right now, I feel really good about your surgery. Why? I tested all three discs and all three were 10 out of 10 pain and they were your concordant pain. So that's a really good sign. Um, of course, the patient doesn't know when I'm injecting the dye. I don't tell him I'm injecting. He's down on his belly, he's looking down at the ground. He's got the drapes around, he can't see anything. He has no idea I'm about to inject that dye. And when I did, it lit him up. He had 10 out of 10 pain. And that pain was his typical pain he gets every day. So that tells me those three discs were the cause of his back pain. And that the Duke laser disc refill, well, that's what that fixes. So I feel really good about it. All right, we'll take questions. All right. Uh, so far, no current questions, but we do have a comment from Shalise Johnson on Facebook. Hi, and, Shalise. And they said, hi, I'm still watching as many of your surgeries as possible as I anxiously and excitedly wait for my MRIs to be reviewed by you. We have the same perspectives and opinions of the pharmaceutical and medical industry. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you all for watching. We will be back in about an hour with, or maybe less, with another Duke Laser Disc Repair Lumbar. And this patient is having L34, L45 done on the right side, okay? For the same reason, herniated 